Tonight, we're in Kirkcaldy in the Adam Smith Theatre, currently celebrating its 125th anniversary. Down the years, it's played host to everything from silent movies to Tommy Cooper to Jules Holland. And tonight, for one night only, us. Welcome to Debate Night. Debate Night is the only show in Scotland where you get to ask the big questions, answering them on our panel here this evening. From the SNP, Michelle Thompson. Michelle joined the party aged 16 and worked in business before becoming an MP and then MSP for Falkirk East. She was named Political Hero of the Year at last year's Holyrood Awards. From the Alba party, Neil Hanvey, previously a member of the SNP. Neil went on to become the Alba MP for Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeath until losing his seat at this year's general election. He's confirmed he's standing for the Scottish Parliament in 2026. Professor David Wilson is the UK's leading criminologist. He was a prison governor and is now a professor of criminology at Birmingham City University. Along the way, he's written 15 books and has presented true crime programmes on TV and a successful podcast as well. Sandesh Gulhani is the Scottish Conservative MSP for Glasgow and the party spokesperson for health and social care. An MSP since 2021, Sandesh still works one day a week as an NHS GP. And finally, from Scottish Labour, Daniel Johnson is the MSP for Edinburgh Southern and the party spokesperson for economy, business and fair work. Daniel's recently introduced a member's bill to prevent the use of physical restraint and seclusion in Scottish schools. Please welcome them all to debate night. <laughs> And of course, welcome to our studio audience here in Kirkcaldy. It's great to be back again in this wonderful venue. And you can join in the discussion from home, wherever you happen to be tonight. BBC DN is the hashtag you need right now on social media. And our Debate Night podcast will be available for you to download straight after tonight's show. So let's get started. Our first question of the night comes from Craig Watson. Craig, good evening. Uh, hello. With the sad passing of Alex Salmond, what's his legacy going to be? Thank you, uh, Craig. Just four weeks ago tonight, Alex Salmond was on debate night with us uh, in Edinburgh, full of energy and full of ideas. And of course, we'd like to send our sympathies out to Moira and his friends and family as well. Michelle Thompson, what's his legacy going to be? If I, I can just say uh, a few things. Firstly, I was fortunate enough to spend a little time in Westminster when Alex Salmond was there. And what struck me was that every time he came into the chamber, the chamber filled with politicians of all parties because the respect was so high for his knowledge. And even if they strongly disagreed with him, and of course many of them did, they were always there to learn or to be impressed by his grasp of the detail. And that's my personal reflection. I'd also reflect on the, the fact that he's a brain uh, the size of a planet. He was unbelievably strategic and visionary. But of course, for me, and that leads to the legacy point, it was what he did for Scotland. I only knew him a little from about 2013, but he consistently put Scotland first and Scotland's interests first in a way that I've not seen before or since. He worked all of the time when I was with him in Westminster. So I think the idea that he was able to take that hard work and that vision and create something, a better place that Scotland could be with audacious ambition. And of course, he saw that being expressed as an independent, a normal independent country, as I do myself. But the legacy he has left is utterly remarkable really is because we all think differently about ourselves now we all think differently and i believe scotland is a better place and will get better still if we follow his vision to the end um i'm here from the audience uh, gentlemen in the back row why was the question put to the smp representative, not to the ALBA representative, considering Alex Salmond was 
member of the Alba party, not SNP. Well, I, I, I will come to Neil in just a second. Most of his career was spent with the SNP. He was an SNP First Minister of Scotland. Yeah, that's why we started that, Michelle. Yeah. I'll pick the point up um, in just a moment. But one of the things that's been very clear, I think, over the course of the last few days uh, are the tributes from across the political Absolutely. spectrum. Sandesh Gohani. Well, I think it's very clear. So I have never uh, met uh, Alex Salmond, but what I would say is that it's quite clear that he is a very significant politician uh, and he has fundamentally changed Scottish politics. Uh, and we need, to, we need to be aware of that. And now, regardless of whether you agree or disagree, uh, and I fundamentally disagree with, with a lot of what Alex Salmond uh, felt and did, um, because I believe that we are better together as, as one country. Uh, but you can't deny the impact that he had to Scottish politics. Uh, and right now, I think our sympathies uh, and our condolences must be with his wife, Moira, and his friends and family, um, uh, as it should be. And we should uh, respectfully talk about him. He, he leaves a, a huge gap in Scottish public life, never mind Scottish political life. Daniel Johnson. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting about Alex Salmond, he's one of these uh, political figures that people from across the political spectrum don't just admire, but actually study. <laughs> because I think there were things that he did, especially in that first period of government from 2007 and to, to 2011, where everyone was expecting that administration to, to fail and collapse. They were a minority. They'd won by just one seat in comparison to Labour. And, and I think that he was somebody who could absolutely make his own political weather. And, and I think, as I've been reflecting on it, I think I'd characterise sort of the early years of the Parliament as th like this. I think if Donald Dewar, I think, gave the, the, the Parliament a seriousness, I think Jack McConnell actually got it delivering. I think what Alex uh, Salmon delivered, and I think very in line with what Michelle was saying, was, was ambition. Was that, that you know, Scotland wasn't to be kept in a box, that this was something to really drive change. And we can disagree about the destination of that change, um, and, and certainly I have a different view, but that sense of ambition, not being constrained by kind of what, what was in front of you, I think is something that, that uh, I think all Scottish polit politicians need to rise to. I, I think we do also just, do, there are obviously some controversies, and I think it's important to, to acknowledge that as well. But then I think, you know, he was a, he was a, he was a complicated man. I just, just really wanted to put that on, on the record too. Neil Hanby, I mean, you, you changed your politics. You, you left the SNP because of him. He was the leader of your party. Yeah, I mean, um, I would first of all like to thank everyone for the kind words uh, uh, about Alec. Look, I, I've made this observation a number of times uh, on my time in politics, that there are principally two types of politicians, uh, people who want to do important things and people who want to feel important. And Alex Salmond absolutely fell into the category of wanting to do important things. And right up until the moment of his death, he was campaigning uh, that as he had done throughout his life, uh, for the betterment of the, the Scottish nation, for Scotland. Uh, and clearly, his final comment on Twitter was that Scotland is a country, not a county. Uh, and such was that belief that he dedicated his life to the, Sco the cause of Scottish independence uh, and to the people of Scotland. It wasn't just a case of he would go down the route of pursuing policies that would only please uh, people who were in the nationalist camp. Alex's policies were about improving the lives of all of the people of Scotland. And I think in that first administration from 2007 to 2011, he was able to take people who would never previously have voted for an SNP administration and give them the confidence that that was the right administration, that was the right fit to drive forward the policy base to lift the people of Scotland, not just in their confidence but actually in, in the day-to-day -day lives and he did a, a whole range of uh, impressive and ambitious policies in that time but up until even recently he has continued to champion those broader causes whether that's challenging the UK government's decision to cut the winter fuel payment for pensioners or trying to prevent the closure uh, the reckless uh, closure of Grangemouth oil refinery. That's, that's what he talked about the last time he was yeah. with us, was with Grangemouth. Given all that, w was he treated fairly? Um, I think we'll all have, uh, have different views on that. I think uh, I can best answer that in uh, the way that I responded 
to news uh, that we'd lost Alec, which was that I had a, an overwhelming sense of sadness. I felt heartbroken, um, but I also felt a, a, a significant degree of anger uh, because I believed that someone of his stature deserved so much better uh, from his latter years uh, than he received, particularly from people who may not have amounted to much had it not been for his support and guidance over the years. So there's a, there's a frustration uh, that he didn't receive uh, the latter years that he deserved. Thank you. Um, <laughs> let's hear from the audience. Lady on the end of the row, yes. I just wonder um, if the panel agrees with the views of Fergus Ewing, who had said that uh, the way that Mr Salmond was treated was similar to how Stalin treated his foes. The way he was erased from the yeah, party history. Yeah, the way that, he, that Mr Salmond was treated by the Scottish Government towards the, you know, and the controversy and whatnot. Uh, Fergus Ewing said that, that the way that he the Scottish Government was treated... Sorry, I'm not making any sense. The way the Scottish Government treated Mr Salmond was the same way that Stalin treated his foes. He was written out of the history of the party, effectively. Michelle Thompson? I, I think what Fergus Ewing was saying in that article that you referenced was that their reference to Alex Salmond on the SNP website had been moved, had been removed, rather. And I think it's no secret that there was certainly a parting of ways between Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond, rather than talking about the Scottish Government. My own personal view is that uh, he should be pronto reinstated because he contributed a huge amount to the SNP. The SNP of today, the SNP that I represent of today, owes him a debt of gratitude. But I would say that Fergus is well known for a very, very colourful turn of phrase and he always writes a good article that catches the eyes but I do think that uh, I hope that moving forward that this represents a kind of rapprochement of relationships and that everyone and that's what I've seen so far regardless of the other political parties or people in the SNP are respectful and applaud the public efforts he made throughout the course of his life that's certainly what I've seen. Okay David Wilson uh, the legacy of Alex Salmond. Nice to see you again. Um, and you've all spoken so incredibly well. It's um, difficult to... Um, I have no personal knowledge of Alex Salmon, but I would say in terms of his legacy, it's quite clear, isn't it? Because I'm probably the oldest person on the panel and perhaps the oldest person in the auditorium. Um, he moved Scottish nationalism from something that had the whiff of cordite about it, something that was fringe and rather mad, and nobody in their right mind would vote for Scottish nationalism and the SNP. And he moved that kind of agenda into something that came very close to fruition in 2014. You know, a few hundred thousand votes another way, this would have been an independent nation. So Alex Salmond was the, that's his legacy, it seems to me. And the, the second part of his legacy is in relation to the SNP, that it's a party that uh, has been in government, can be elected. That's a, that's a, a, a tremendous achievement. And I think actually, because of course, as most people know, I live in England, I, I think of uh, Salmond and Sturgeon very much in the same way as I used to think as Cameron and Osborne. And before Cameron and Osborne, I thought, think of them in the same light as Blair and Brown. You know, so they had a real UK-wide uh, reputation. I think as I, I, I pick up some of the, the tension and the, uh, you made perfect sense, if I may say. Um, <laughs> um, I pick up some of the, the controversy around, and of course we mustn't ignore the fact that there, despite his sad passing, that um, there are still a couple of court cases, aren't there? And those court cases will be resolved one way or another in due course. And the, com the implications of those court cases are you know, pretty damning if they find on behalf of what Alex Salmond had alleged in relation to the Scottish government. And there will be 
real consequence. And Michelle, you spoke absolutely beautifully and movingly about him. But the question, the question that, that Fergus Ewing was getting at seemed to me to have more depth than absolutely. simply a good turn of phrase. He was actually getting at malfeasance mm -hmm. on the part of civil servants in the <laughs> Scottish government who were deliberately providing disinformation or misinformation so as to damage his character um, to, the, to the detriment. And we know there have been cases, and he's won every one so far. You know, there, there are four court cases, and I think he's won three, and the fourth is still to come. You, you'll be in a better position than me to know. But quite clearly, um, you know, he was somebody who had a reputation outside of Scotland. He was somebody that stayed in Scotland but had his reputation outside of Scotland. So the passing of a really, really first-rate politician, and that was what so surprised me. I saw Gordon Brown, late of this parish, who, of course, was very moving in terms of his um, words about Alex Salmond. David Davis, um, are mm -hmm. on the right wing of the Conservative Party, not yeah. you, like yourself, you're a moderate, from my understanding of the things that you were saying, Sandish. So here are, here are people from the opposite ends of the political spectrum saying some really generous and warm things about, uh, about Alex Salmond, yeah. and I think, Scotland has lost one of its very best. Uh, just on the, the, the point that Michelle was making about she would like to see a rapprochement within the independence movement now. Mm -hmm. Is that possible right uh, now? Well, uh, in some respects, it's completely unnecessary. Uh, uh, but in certain specific circumstances, it's absolutely necessary and will be difficult and painful. And that's because, so, I left the SNP for a variety of reasons that I won't go into the detail of tonight. Um, but I still have a huge number of friends in the SNP, both parliamentarians and ordinary members. Uh, and my relationship with them uh, is as kindred and friendly as it has always been. But there is a... But the vote is split. But, for, but, the, for the people here, but, they've got a choice of who they, they vote for. Well, you're talking about the relationship between those two parties, and, and it is really important, particularly around voting. But the, the, what I'm saying is that the difficulty that exists between our two parties is at a very senior level and it is only going to be resolved when the cases uh, that David alluded to are finally explored and the truth is exposed for everyone to see. Because, you know, the, the idea, the genesis of the idea of the Alpa party was not to be in direct competition with the SNP. It was to complement the voters in the SNP so that we could have what I would call a salmon supermajority in the Scottish Parliament, where the Scottish Parliament becomes the voice of the people of Scotland to express its democratic right to independence. And, and that was the idea. The idea of Alpa was never to be in competition with the SNP. And unfortunately, there are certain actors in the SNP who chose to put their own personal uh, priorities and their own personal power uh, above that idea of giving the people of Scotland so the right... you can't move on, you're saying, until these court cases are resolved. I'm saying that the majority would... okay. of the members in the Alba party and the SNP don't need to move on because we're all still friends. Okay. Okay. But there right. is a, a problem at the top. All right, I, I'm sure we'll discuss this again. This evening, we are in Kirkcaldy. Next week, we're going to be in Glasgow. The week after that, we're going to be in Edinburgh. If you'd like to come along and be part of the audience for their sh those shows, just go to the address, bbc.co.uk forward slash debate night and click on the link. Let's go to our second question of the night, which comes from Morna, Morna Fleming. Evening, Morna. Thank you. What is the panel's view on the proposal to put obese people on weight loss drugs for up to five years, primarily to relieve the pressures on the NHS caused by obesity? Uh, thank you. Obesity costs the NHS in Scotland an estimated £600 million a year. Are weight loss drugs the answer, Morna is asking, Sandesh Gohani, do you see this in your surgery? Have you prescribed? No, I, I'm a practicing NHS GP. In fact, I've come from a, a GP surgery today. Uh, and, and Morna, I think the, the crux of the question is how can we afford to continue providing free care for all of our citizens, all at a high level? And if we continue to treat the NHS as a repair shop, it is impossible to do that. 
What we need to do is focus on prevention. Uh, I wrote a paper, the Sodge Conservatives, wrote a paper called Modern Efficient Local. Uh, and the heart of my premise is using prevention to stop us accessing the NHS. Uh, uh, and are weight loss so, drugs so, part of that? So, yeah, well, yeah. So one, one example uh, is, is for diabetics, type 1 diabetics to have a hyperloop. Essentially, we spend 10% of the NHS budget on diabetic side effects. This hyperloop will stop that from happening. If people are overweight, then they are at significant risk of multiple morbidities and giving them weight loss drugs, giving them an ability to lose weight in a safe way is something that would enhance their life, reduce their risks, and if you're in the NHS, it will actually make it easier for you because you're not having to deal with the side effects. There's a lot of people, Standish. I mean, it's one in three children, two out of three adults in Scotland. Yeah, it could be up to a million people eligible for the criteria for these weight loss drugs. Well, well, it, wouldn't, it depends what you set the criteria to be. And for me, you'd set the criteria to be what we currently use for uh, gastric surgery, for bypass surgery, for people who are morbidly obese. And Scotland is the most obese nation in Europe. And we need to be aware of that and we need to tackle the, the, the rise of obesity, but we also need to tackle the rise of other unhealthy things that happen in Scotland. Um, we are the drug death capital of Europe. We have rising amounts of alcohol deaths. These are all totally unacceptable in our country. So prevention, uh, so we not need cure. To prevent it. Okay, okay, let me hear from the lady in the front row first. Yeah, on you. You see, Scotland, uh, as the obese country, how would you propose to prevent obesity in the beginning? Mm. See, when you go shopping, mm -hmm. right, some people can't afford to buy what mm. they call good food. Surely somebody should be able to step in and say, right, this is how we're going to do it, even in children from a very early age. Parents either introduce them to healthy diets, so it depends on mm. what their income is. So surely there must be a way forward to prevent obesity in people in Scotland. Sandra? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I'm glad you asked this. I I've been meeting supermarkets uh, to try to make it easier for people to buy healthier food. So an example, um, you could go to some of, well, on the BBC, so I won't mention the names, but there's some, some places you could go online and they deliver you the food uh, and you cook it. But that's really expensive. It's really expensive. So why can't... Aldi, Lidl, provide a grab bag with all the ingredients you need. Instead of having to walk around the store and find everything, a little grab bag of their meal of the, the week, which is full of healthy foods. It doesn't have to contain, you could have a vegetarian version and a meat version, and an instruction on how to cook it. We need our children within schools to be shown that actually healthy doesn't mean disgusting. Healthy can be really sweet. You know, fruit is extremely sweet. Uh, we need to make sure that they understand what things are, get to try them. Because if you're young, if you're a little child and you're eating bananas and apples and you're eating figs and grapes and all sorts and all these things you can buy from Lidl, these are the things that will then lead the child to say to the parent, oh, can we have that? Okay, can we uh, get that? Other supermarkets are available. <laughs> uh, man in the back row first. Yes, on you go. Um, for me, this is just another example of government policy that is dealing with the effect and not the root cause of the problem. Yeah. There is so much weight constantly on what has happened, yeah. rather than asking the big question is why we are in this state. Thank you. Uh, and the lady with the long hair, just two down from you. Yes. Um, no, I totally agree with that as well. But I think my main issue here is that we are going through a cost of living crisis, just like the woman mentioned earlier. How are we expecting people who cannot even afford to heat their homes, even to use like electrical appliances, mm -hmm. to be making healthier meals? What are we actually going to be doing to help these people with young children who are going to be giving them food that is going to be more cheaper? So possibly like, you know, you're talking about chicken nuggets and chips and things that are going to probably cost them a lot less money, but mm. it's going to be in causing um, to have obesity and to have these kids because they're going to be eating these meals constantly because they're cheaper and they cannot afford these healthier alternatives. Yeah, exactly. Okay, That's okay. I mean, okay. okay. Sandish, no, hang on, I'll come back it's, to you. It's I'll really come back important. To you. Dar Daniel, Daniel. I have to say, listening to those contributions, I think we've got this the wrong way round. I think we should be sitting in the audience and have the audience <laughs> members on the, on the stage, because I think those last couple of contributions are, are spot on. Look, this is a really complicated issue, and there's no doubt that obesity has really dramatic uh, health impacts, 
really dramatic economic impacts. It, it, you know, it has impacts in terms of people's ability to work and so on. But I think what the gentleman said at the back there is, is are we looking at the symptom or the cause? You know, the, the, the reality is that if you look at the correlation between inequality in, in countries and obesity, well, the higher in, inequality levels, the higher the obesity levels. And it's because of what the, 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 the lady said, just two seats along, is that... Ultimately, if, if, if you are finding yourself uh, you know, struggling to make ends meet, very often it, it, the food that's cheaper is the, the food that's not so good for you. So, look, I, I, I think we should be looking at all our options. I, you know, I, I'm, I don't have the benefit of medical training like Sandesh. I think we should be open to, to treatments like this, but I think we should look at social prescribing. We absolutely need to make sure that, that healthy food is, is available to people. We need to ensure that people know how to cook. I think, really, you know, I, I, you know, I'm old enough to have been taught home economics at school, but actually making sure that people can learn how to cook. But ultimately, it comes back to what the gentleman at the back said. Unless you're tackling inequality, making sure that people have access to good work, that have good wages so they can afford to buy the right things in, in the supermarket, whatever, whichever one you choose to use, Stephen, um, then you're really going to keep coming back to this problem. But we have to look at it holistically. Okay, okay, lady with the scarf down here, yes. Yeah, um, I worked with families um, and we worked with young children and they didn't even, even know sometimes what a pear was, never mind a fig. Yeah. But um, it's about, and again, picking up what you said, People don't know, a lot of people don't know how to cook because they've never been shown. I used to work with families who then, we, we did cooking courses with them and it was amazing the change in their diet. Once they knew how to cook very, very simple things like soup, etc., yeah. which is healthy. Mm -hmm. Depending on what you put in it, I suppose. But, <laughs> uh, you know, and so it's, uh, that's about getting to the root cause. It's about working with the families, working with the children, doing that in schools, doing that in the communities. But a lot of the community work is, is gone because there's no money to keep it, keep it going and keep it developed. OK, thank you. Um, Michelle, back to Morna's question. Are weight loss drugs uh, the solution to this crisis with obesity in the NHS right now? Well, I, I, I would reiterate what Daniel said. I think we've had some great points made in the audience. And to be honest, I thought that being proposed as a singular policy was really quite bizarre because it failed to recognise through the publicity around it all the other com complex factors that you in the audience have brought out, and in, in including education. And so, no, it won't. It won't even address the prevention thing because they're obese in the first but place. But we are where we are. We've got two-thirds oh, yeah. of adults so, uh, obese I, or overweight. I agree. I'm we? not saying that they can't be part of a wider package of care. But even if you have that, you're not getting anywhere near the issues in our society. And I suppose the only point I think that's not been brought out thus far is the kind of the power of some of the food companies and how that's represented, particularly through supermarkets. It's so pervasive, mm -hmm. this kind of fat lure. And if the, the, the products, various products are very, very cheap and very high in fat and so on, and we've still not cracked that nut in terms of the food we're able to access in addition to all the other points. So, I mean, I, I felt it was a bit trite to be honest, listening to that as an idea when reality, poverty, there's such a clear link between poverty yeah. and obesity. We need to start tackling these big issues. Thank you. Uh, Lydia in the white jacket, blonde lady there, yes. Hi, um, I would just like to ask yourself, obviously if, if the medicated route is something that you think is possible, I imagine for the people who would take this route, they'd have to have regular checkups with their GP in a country where your population cannot get an appointment with a GP, mm. how do you plan to accommodate that? Sandesh? Well, um, so, sorry, can I, just the point, just before I do come to, to your question, um, a bowl of dal with rice costs you a couple of quid, mm -hmm. uh, and chicken nuggets and chips cost you about a pound a portion. Um, so actually, if we address, and the lady at the front was talking about cooking, uh, if we address people's fear of cooking, you can't really get dal wrong. Um, but you just need to know how to do it. So that's why the idea of getting a grab bag uh, and, and, and learning how to do it is very important um, and, and cheaper uh, because you're cooking fresh ingredients. Um, but to, to, to your point, 
um, these drugs would be an alternative to gastric bypass surgery. So these are people who are already morbidly obese. These are not people um, who are going towards that. Uh, and so you have a choice to make. Would you give these medications to somebody or would you um, give them a gastric bypass? It's cheaper to give the drugs and probably a little bit safer as well with the side effect profile. So it's, it's not a straightforward okay. one. Um, right. But certainly when it comes to being seen in the community, um, bloods would be taken by our nurse in the CTAC uh, and that would go straight back to the okay. consultant. All right, all right. David Wilson, um, weight loss drugs, are they the answer to the crisis in the NHS at the moment? Um, my wife and I have been walking in Fife all day and we seem to have survived on cake and tablets. So uh, I'm, slightly, <laughs> I'm slightly worried. This is Jittery, this sugar is rush. A sugar rush. Um, I'm also pleased that we've addressed the elephant in the sitting room, which is obesity is linked to poverty. Yep. And you have to kind of tackle some of the underlying causes if you really want to make inroads onto this as an issue. But the figures are startling, to be perfectly honest. The last time I looked, it was one in four people in the United Kingdom are obese, not morbidly obese, but obese. Uh, the NHS spends 11 billion pounds a year dealing with issues related to obesity and type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. So we are where we are. And if there is, uh, and there is some evidence, there are only two studies that I'm aware of that have shown that being given these weight loss drugs will actually reduce your weight. Therefore, there is a benefit in terms of not using NHS facilities. But the other key thing that I think it was I heard Wes Streeting say was that that would increase um, mm. the possibilities in the workforce. The evidence for that seems to be weaker um, because I imagine that if you get yourself into a position where you are obese, then the idea of work becomes less of an issue for you because you, you feel that you've lost the skills that you might have been able to have used within the workplace. So uh, for me, if this is a solution, albeit it's a singular solution, isn't tackling those underlying things that, and Daniel mentioned inequality, Michelle mentioned poverty, many of members of the audience have talked about some of those holistic things, but we are where we are and we have to start somewhere. And so personally, I think I, I'm prepared to see if this is going to work. I know there's a trial in Greater Manchester to see how this will actually work in practice, yeah. and that's going to take three years. And so there will, at the end of the day, be some empirical evidence um, to, to show us whether or not it did indeed do what it was meant to have done. And I personally, if I have any more tablet tonight, <laughs> you have got to make a physical intervention <laughs> and stop me. All right, we, we have been warned. <laughs> Gentlemen down here in the grey top, yes. How about uh, VAT and tax-free fruit and veg for everybody? Make it cheaper in Scotland. And also seasonal veg in Scotland. Stop transporting veg from abroad. Interesting, interesting. Uh, man with the white hair and the black jacket. Yes, on you go. Yeah, you, yes. Uh, does the panel feel that minimum pricing on alcohol actually means that alcohol dependent or alcoholics actually take less alcohol? Okay, well, it's a slightly separate question from weight loss. I just want to try and keep it on this issue of weight loss at the moment. Um, Neil, what, what do you think about this? Are weight loss drugs part of the answer or the whole answer here? Well, I'll, I'll split it into two, two, two sections. First of all, um, let's talk about the, the, treating the symptoms instead of tackling the root cause, because that is fundamentally what we need to do. And unless we do something substantial to improve life chances for young people, to tackle poverty uh, and increase the economic benefit for the vast majority, so if I cast my mind back to Adam Smith, he said something along the lines of no society can be flourishing and happy if the greater part of its members are poor and hungry. And, uh, and so, unless everyone, you... everyone wants to, Everyone in the panel and everyone in the audience wants that to happen, but what are we going to do about a situation well, that we're in right now with well, the, Well, sorry, that is the challenge. And so, unless you deal with some of the 
obvious sequelae that, that um, uh, is part of this picture. So high sugar foods, refined sugars in a whole range of things. So sorry for the cake and tablet fans. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a good idea. There's lots of emerging research about the, um, the role that sugar plays in a range of different health conditions, not least uh, diabetes and insulin uh, desensitisation. But um, So that's one of the challenges that we need to tackle. But tackling poverty not only addresses those types of issues, it also looks at things like um, alcohol misuse, drug and, uh, uh, and other substance misuse. Uh, and there are certain things that we can do. We can open sports facilities to young people at a far greater, uh, far, far less cost than they currently uh, have to pay so that they are, are able to exercise and able to access that. Uh, and we also need to hold these massive food corporations who make billions of pounds out of ultra-processed food that they target the poor with. And that is a, an absolute key driver for many of the problems related to not just obesity, but a whole range of health issues. And the second part, which is really important, is, is the government really suggesting that they will either force or coerce people who are overweight to take a drug against their consent so that they can I access don't, don't think that's what's being benefits. Proposed. Because, but I mean, what is the what is the uh, uh, what is the consent that you would seek if you say to someone, "We want you to get back into the workforce, and to do that, you have to take a Zempic." I mean, that is simply immoral, and it should not be considered as a solution to a problem we know is driven by poverty. Yeah, I don't think that is being suggested no. at, at the moment. Um, your views on all of this at home? The hashtag is BBCDN on social media. Morna, you've got your hand back up. You asked the question, what do you think? Yeah, I've been very interested to hear all the contributions from the audience and from the panel. Uh, my initial concern in asking this question was that I think we as a society have rather sleepwalked into this situation where a quarter of our population is obese. But as David said, we are where we are and we have to deal with it now. Um, and I don't think there was ever going to be any question of coercion. I mean, this has to be voluntary, otherwise it's not going to happen. But on the other hand, we are in this situation. There is a link between obesity and poverty. Childhood poverty in particular has been a priority of the SNP for the past 17 years. And as far as I can see, the figures have not moved or have perhaps increased. So there is a big job of work to be done in order to address the root, one of the root causes of this obesity or epidemic. Michelle? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the most startling step forward has been the introduction of the Scottish Child Payment, which we saw introduced and it's been increased a, a number of times. But that, that is only, again, part of the picture. We've got an economy, a wider economy in the UK that's frankly not working across the board, and it can only be part of the, the picture. I completely agree with you that child poverty, because that instigates patterns through their life, it has a whole range of impacts in their ability to learn and so on, so that has to be addressed. But the point you make, even if the Scottish child payment was quadrupled again, how much of a systemic impact would that make because the picture is very, very okay. complex. Right. There's a whole range that, of areas. That leads us quite nicely into our next question tonight. Everything you hear on the programme, if you want to get involved in the debate, the hashtag is BBCDN on social media right now. Let's go to our third question from Janet this evening. Janet Curran. Good evening, Janet. Good evening. I'd like to ask the panel what they intend to do about the appalling levels of violence in schools. Mm. Thank you. Um, teachers in Fife report rising violence in schools, uh, not just from pupils, but from parents as well. EIS survey um, just last month uh, showed 94% of teachers had experienced violent incidents in the last four years, and 61% had been assaulted. Professor David Wilson, what do you think is going on? <laughs> uh, so, um, I suppose violence is my specialist subject, so let me do a few um, remarks uh, in, in preface. The first is uh, we shouldn't imagine that uh, this is a new problem. Um, violence has existed in schools in my own time, in my parents' time, 
in my grandparents' time. We might have new ways of understanding that violence because of social media, but even if I think about how on some social media platforms there are kids attacking other kids and putting it on social media, prior to that we had happy slapping way back in the early noughties. So, you know, for many kids, school is a space that has to be endured and survived as opposed to a space where they learn and thrive. I think the second thing I would say is pre uh, as a preface um, is what do we mean by violence? And obviously, I think I know what your question implies. You're not talking about those microaggressions which damage kids in school all the time, the taunting, the bullying, the exclusion. You're talking about kicks and stabbing. Physical violence and is what physical teachers are things. reporting. And there are things that can be done. There are things that can be done. But can I say, often I'm asked this question in the context of violence in maximum security prisons. <laughs> and in prisons, there are so many advantages that the prison has that the school can never hope to have. And there's only one prison that I'm aware of that's ever been able to design violence out of that environment, and it's a prison in Aylesbury called HMP Grendon. And even though Grendon locks up men who are regarded as damaged, dangerous, and disturbed, it has no punishment block because nobody needs to be punished because of the regime that it runs, which is as a therapeutic community. So what so, can we learn from that? And what we can learn from that is back to the point about holistic approaches. If the child feels, and remember my preface remarks, if the child feels that they are wanted there, that they are going to survive, that they can thrive, if the child feels that they can trust those in authority to protect them, if the culture of that school operates in the way that I have been describing about HMP Grendon, then there are greater opportunities to reduce the level of violence in that environment. Okay. But one of the things that I'm really keen to talk about in England is to pay attention to the incredible successes of Scotland. I'm often not listened to because it wasn't invented in England, <laughs> but can I assure you that in 2006, Glasgow had the per capita highest murder rate yeah. in the whole of Europe. And 10 years later, it had reduced the amount of violence mm. and murder in the city by over 60%. It is an extraordinary achievement that was created by the Glasgow Violence Reduction Strategy. So change can happen. That's the, that's and that's the point. my point. Yeah. Change can happen. And so I, I don't underestimate at all the level of violence that you, that you were just, uh, talking about and that Stephen gave us figures for. And things can be done. But please, let's try and think through this rather than those instrumental approaches like, you know, kind of scanners at the school gates uh, to uh, detect uh, okay. knives or right. whatever, because that just pushes the problem elsewhere. Okay. I know we've got teachers in the audience tonight, and we've got parents, so obviously I'd love to hear from you. Man with the beard, there, yeah. Um, do you think it's to a degree um, what children can access on the internet nowadays yeah. that mm. will be a rise in the violence? And also, there's a smacking man in Scotland on your kids which I fully support, I don't agree with smacking your children. Do you think that itself could um, contribute to the misbehaviour of maybe like taking a consequence where you know, like, I can do what I want, I'm not going to get punishment. There's no consequences. Okay, yeah. Michelle Thompson, there is a Scottish Government action plan against mm -hmm. violence in schools. When's the action going to begin? <laughs> well, it's already, it's already underway. I'd like to pick up the lady's first point, first of all, and see what's not been said in terms of how personally how much I uh, support what teachers are going through. I am aware that there's an issue in Fife because I know some teachers in Fife and I absolutely condemn violence against teachers. What's going it, on? Why is there an issue here? Well, I, I think we've had a very eloquent uh, layout from, uh, from the professor here. This is very, very complex and I'm just rewriting the balance here because we know that in many cases we're dealing with traumatised 
children. There's a lot of stuff going on in society at the moment. And we need, it's very, very complex to work that through. I am simply writing the other side of the balance that for teachers who are trying to deal with that, often with a shortage of resources, even in terms of time, it, this is a very, very complex nut to crack. So going back to your point, yes, absolutely, the Scottish Government is working very hard on that. But as, you know, the example of the Glasgow Police, which I'm very well aware of as well, it doesn't happen overnight. And, and whether it's a combination of the things that have been pointed out about what people can access in the internet, a breakdown of community standards, a breakdown of the way people used to live their lives in terms of support for children, cost of living crisis, poverty, because hungry children can be aggressive children. All of these things play into it. And the last point I would make is that we all have a role in this. Now, you could quite rightly sit here and say, yeah, well, Michelle, the SNP, your party's in government, and I fully accept that, but I think we've all got a role because we all recognise, we all see in our societies the breakdown that's been happening, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed as well. These things are happening for a multitude of complex reasons. Okay, okay, let me go to the gentleman with the glasses and the beard and moustache. Yes, hello. Hello. Uh, a, I just, the SNP lady, everything seems to be blamed on poverty, mm -hmm. whether it's a, poverty. obesity or it's kids in school, it seems to come back to the same thing. But what I was going to say was, uh, it comes from the parents, there's no discipline in these kids' houses, mm -hmm. and so when they come to school, they just act up because there's really consequences at home. You're right. As soon as you said that, hands went up, <laughs> yeah. uh, especially the lady in the white top in the front row here. <laughs> yes, what do you think? As a parent of two additional needs, children. Vi my two are not, I'm not going to say this for every child, but my two are not violent children and some children that do have additional needs do get the majority of the blame because not everyone understands a child with additional needs. Yeah. Right, okay, yeah. thank you. A, a man with the glasses here in the front of the moustache. Yes, you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you. On you go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Only you. Uh, I'm a father of four children. I know the children need to be disciplined. Um, does this mean the regulation, you know, to ban the smart children? This is, you know, this is wrong. Wrong regulation should be abolished. Mm -hmm. oh. are, you, are you worried about a lack of respect no. from children towards adults? No, I mean, you know, the children not very dis disciplined in, in, in the home and in the school. Okay. Previously, the teachers got more power to discipline children, mm. but nowadays, mm. this seems like they lost this kind of power now. Okay, Daniel Johnson, is that the problem? Uh, look, I, I think there's a, a lot of different things going on. I mean, I think we're still figuring out what the impact on children has been of uh, COVID and lockdown. I think the gentleman are asking about the internet is right. There, 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 I mean, I think there's a growing concern, and I think there's increasing evidence about the use of mobile phones, social media, kind of that constant, you know, scrolling up, scrolling down, whichever it, <laughs> your app asks you to do. Um, but I think there were some other things going on as well, and some of them are more prosaic. We, we, we've got fewer teachers in our schools than we had in 2007. We have an increase in children with additional support needs, but we've got fewer additional support needs teachers. There's fewer lab assistants. Uh, and there's fewer uh, non-teaching staff in our schools. I think if you have less people in schools, then it's much harder to give children that kind of direct relationship that I think David is alluding to that you need, that, that relationship of, of respect. And then finally, I think there is a problem around consequences. Now, no one's talking about kind of some return to Victorian schooling, but I think if children uh, do uh, behave in ways that are unacceptable, then there, there need to be things that, that, that happen. There need to be more specialist teaching units for those uh, children with uh, uh, you know, challenging uh, behaviours. But what you can't do, and all too often I've seen this in my own casework, you'll have uh, children that, that, that are behaving uh, you know, incredibly disruptively, and there may be well be underlying causes, and, and essentially the, the schools go, well, you know, you just got to understand that's the way you know, that child behaves and you need to get on with it. That can't be right. Okay. It can't be right for the okay. child. It can't be right for the other children in the classroom. So I think we need better resources for the classroom and there need to be a kind of consequences. And I don't mean necessarily mean punitive consequences, but when challenging behaviour arises, something happens. There has to be boundaries. People don't just carry on Boundaries have to be exactly. set. Sandesh Gohani. 
let me start by saying it's completely unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable that we have a rise in violence in our schools. And there's a number of things that I would like to talk about. We have an SNP government that has just given £12.5 million to educate children in Africa when Glasgow City Council are cutting 400 teachers, when your children are now having increased class sizes, where we do not have basic support needs for our or deaf teachers. children, our children who have additional support needs. I went to East Park, which is a fantastic uh, place in my community for people with additional needs, with really severe additional needs, and they have got people through to national qualifications. What an amazing place with appropriate resources. So what's the link and we're between not that, that and violence but, in schools? But, well, it's, it's the lack of resources, the lack of people. But we also are seeing a lack of consequences, not just in schools, but around us, this increase in antisocial behaviour. We're seeing people brazenly use drugs on our street. We're seeing a presumption of people under 25 not, not being punished fully. We, are, we have a SNP government who is soft on crime on the side of our criminals and not on the side Hardly. of victims. That's and nonsense. that's what we really need to do. All right. Absolute Let nonsense. Let me hear from the audience on this. Uh, Man with the beard on the back row. Yeah. I think one consideration you've not considered at all there is that the children now have had, went through a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. Yeah. Speaking about my son, the children were necessarily put, put in the house for two years, locked away. You know, my son was in P6, he bounced into P7, and he had no transition whatsoever to high school. So he went from a school with a small number of pupils to then going to a school with 2,000 pupils. Building those social relationships for him in their formative years, there was children missed, you know, that, that step from school to university or college. That had a profound effect on them. Yeah. And I don't think that has really been looked at in any way, shape or form. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll pick that up in a second. Blonde lady on the very back row. Yes. Uh, Michelle, you're saying the Scottish government's doing something about violence in schools. They're not. We're told, fill out a forum. Fill out the forum, build a picture. Fill out the forum, build a picture. How many times do school teachers and pupil support assistants get bit, spat at, kicked, things thrown at them? Fill out a forum. It's not happening. Well, what's been your experience in schools? There's been a lot of violence in schools, um, and it's getting worse. It really is getting worse. And the local council, they're having inclusion. You've got to include the child. Uh, and it's, that, it's daily. That, it's that, daily that, people are getting hit, they're getting bit, they're getting things thrown at them. Where, where does it stop? And, and You're that saying it's point, not acceptable. But has it been it since the pandemic that you've noticed this change? Yes. Is that the difference? Yes, it has yeah. got worse, yeah. But, you know, you go, you go to the shops, you go to the doctor's surgery, mm -hmm. there's signs up saying staff will not tolerate mm -hmm. abuse, but you do it at school. Neil Hanby. Let's circle back to David's opening point, which is understanding the fundamental issue uh, and, and having a clear strategy to, 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 to meet all of the challenges. So I think that's probably the first thing. What, one point I would make is that um, children who have adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, mm -hmm. um, we know from uh, already extant literature that that has a consequence, not just on their behaviour, but on their view of themselves and whether they where they fit in the world and whether they matter. And so it's very, and I, I don't mean this in a pejorative way, it's very easy for us to say, well, they should behave appropriately. But if that's not something that's actually uh, built into them because of the experiences that they've had and, and they act out in a way that is challenging, then we're not really understanding the problem, and it might be to do with the pandemic, it might be to do with poverty, it might be to do with drug and alcohol abuse in the home. There could be a whole range of things. But we need to understand what it is at the background that is uh, um, precipitating this level of violence, because once it starts and it's celebrated in social media and becomes the in thing to do, then children are going to encourage each other to do it. So I think we need to have a proper... 
um, broad look at the data that exists. I don't think we need to do a longitudinal study. We just need to know what's happening. Well, the and get a, are telling and get a us. Proper, the, the teachers but, are telling us what's well, happening. We, we know what's happening at the sharp end. What we don't know fully is what are the precipitating factors and what can we do about them? Now, part of that will be changing the, the culture in schools, supporting teachers with the right kind of tools so that they can tackle uh, violence. Because at the moment, most teachers are, uh, 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 as I think the lady said, you're just told to fill out a form. Well, that is no help yeah. whatsoever. Uh, so we need a comprehensive uh, policy, a comprehensive strategy to meet this challenge because children who don't value or see uh, a valid place for themselves in the world are not going to be considering what their behaviour, the, the, the consequences yeah. of their behaviour on others. Okay, that's okay, not, okay, that's okay. not within their um, grasp. Lady, the blonde lady just behind Morna there in the middle. Yes, on you go. Um, a few months ago, Jenny Gilruth actually stood up and said that the behaviour in schools had nothing to do with the Scottish Government. It was up to the Council to sort out. <laughs> so is there any wonder the teachers are not <laughs> sure what no. to do? Michelle, Michelle Thompson? It was that's reported, it was reported yeah, that that's she had said this. A wee spoiler alert, just because something's reported doesn't mean to say it's true. Mm -hmm. At no point, as Jenny Gilruth said, it's well, nothing it, it was, to do with the video, Scottish it Government. It was videoed her saying it. Look, the councils clearly have a pivotal role. The Scottish Government clearly has a pivotal role. There's a whole variety of agencies that have an important role, and we in society have an important role as well. I don't, do not think for a minute that the Scottish Government is bucking what they need to do. And I think you've heard some good reflections here of why this is very, very complex. Something clearly needs to be done, but the something is just not one quick fix. No. Uh, man in the check shirt in the front row. I think the kids have got <clears throat> too much access to inappropriate materials, yeah. whether it's gaming, uh, YouTube, uh, even the cartoons. The cartoons on TV are extremely violent. I mean, I sit and watch them with the grandsons, and they may be funny, but they are violent. Tom and Jerry's Tom always Jerry. been violent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. But, but there's yeah. no watershed on YouTube, and, and yeah. it's easy yeah. for parents, you know, just to hand the kid a tablet, and there you go. OK. Uh, gentleman with the glasses on the end there, yes. Uh, just to add very briefly, I agree with the lady behind me that Jenny Gilruz did say that, and it was on Martin Geisler on, Sunday, on the Sunday paper, uh, Sunday... Sunday show. Your colleague, yes. Yeah. OK. Oh. And, and gentleman on the end, at the back row there, yes. Um, I work in the town centre in Kirkcaldy every weekend and we are regularly plagued with groups of up to 20 to 30 um, youngsters um, under the influence of alcohol and drugs, continuously fighting. We're having to go in to separate these kids and they are organising conflicts from town to town because they've been given free bus travel. Okay. And is social media part of that as Yes, well? they are organising okay. these okay. meets okay. and then they're travelling from Kirkcaldy so, okay. to Glenrithes or Dunfermline right. to so, cause Thank you. Fights. We've got so many hands up, I know, on this. And we talked about this the last time we were in Kirkcaldy, but we're out of time, I'm afraid, this evening. But we'll be back. Yeah. That's it for tonight. Uh, we are next week in Glasgow. The week after that, we are going to be in Edinburgh. Have a look at our website if you want to come along and join us. If you miss any of tonight's show, we're repeated later on BBC One Scotland, or you can catch it any time on the BBC iPlayer. Thank you very much indeed to my panel here tonight and to our audience in Kirkcaldy and to you at home for watching. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well from all of us in Kirkcaldy. Good night.